Today's episode is sponsored in full by Heartlift International, a 501c3 dedicated to making home and family the safest, most secure place on earth. To learn more about Heartlift International, visit JanelleRairdon.com slash Heartlift dash international. Hello and welcome to today's Heartlift with Janelle. Women today now have more professional opportunities beyond what previous generations ever imagined. But as our roles in public life have grown, the church's vision for women's work and calling has not grown with us, leaving us feeling isolated and under-resourced. Christian women face multiple tensions between home and work, navigating complex gender dynamics in the workplace and social pressure to hold together picture-perfect lives. Our guest today, Joanna Meyer, author of Women, Work, and Calling, Step Into Your Place in God's World, addresses a critical gap in Christian women's discipleship by speaking to the roles we play in public and professional life. Acknowledging the brokenness of workplaces and industries, she provides a theological framework for women's work and influence and offers resources for the challenges of working life. Our conversation today and Joanna's new book will help us ignite our vocational imagination with a biblical framework for work and calling. Calling is such a word to me. It's it's near and dear to my heart. She's going to help us build strength from within with emotional and spiritual health to support our work. You know, I love her already. And to navigate common workplace challenges with practical tools to help our influence grow. She also will help us pursue purposeful relationships, collaborating and building strong relationships with others. We will learn in her book and our conversation today the lived experience of godly female leaders and discover how you and me can have a redemptive impact through our work in the home and outside the home and both. So would you please welcome to the show, Joanna Meyer. Welcome. Yes. Hi, Janelle. It's so great to be here. (laughs) I've told them all about you, uh, everything uh, that I could read on your beautiful intros and all of those media kits that we get sent. But you have just shared such a big part of your heart with me uh, prior to pressing record. It brought me to just a deep place in my heart. If you wouldn't mind telling us perhaps the story behind women work and calling and how you my new dear friend has <laughs> has had to walk a, a different road to perhaps do the work you're doing today. Yeah, I had done some writing early this year and called my life um, the grief and grace of an unexpected career. And yeah. I think that really informs a little bit about why I'm so passionate about this conversation about whole life discipleship for Christian women. And mm-hmm. it, it flows from my own journey um, that I happen to be single and, and I've had a really rich full life. I'm in my late forties, um, and have really desired to be married and done everything. I know how I've had online dates, blind setups, done everything. I've been faithful at church, hoping some guy would show up in every Christian conference. I think maybe this is where it'll be. Where um, is he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've lost weight. I've worn high heels. I've dressed snappy. You know, I've just like done everything. Red lipstick. I- no, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Red lipstick. And, um, the Lord has not chosen to provide that type of relationship for my life. And that began a journey for me of asking deeper questions of just saying, okay, so I'm not checking the boxes of marriage and motherhood that I thought would be kind of the primary influences in my life. Like if you had asked me in my late twenties, early thirties, I was excited about my work. I I trained to be a high school social studies teacher. And um, that. that idea of education and of learning has always been a value to me. But I always assumed that that was just kind of a temporary thing, that marriage in particular would answer the bigger questions in my life. Um, Mm. And so as I moved through 29 into 30, I wasn't panicking, but I was disoriented. A friend had asked me, where do you see yourself going in the next five years? And I remember kind of stumbling and being like, well, 
I don't know, maybe grad school. Um, Cause I just did not have a vision for what my life had looked like. I had so depended on the mm. roles of marriage and or motherhood to fill that kind of structure in my life that yeah. when that didn't happen, um, I really had to go on a search to figure out how do I for, provide some direction for the next steps in my life? In addition to being a woman who has leadership gifts and in my local mm-hmm. faith communities, that was not acknowledged or developed in any way. And so awesome. I really was finding my myself lost in knowing what to do with who God had made me and the situation and circumstances that he had brought into my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so during that season of searching, I began to work on a master's degree in social entrepreneurship. I was studying at a Christian business school. Oh. Oh, how exciting. Wow. I had been in the corporate sector for a few years and was just intrigued by the, the resources and the types of relationships that were flowing through the business sector. And so I wanted to figure out, could business, could commerce be used for kingdom good? And as part mm. of that journey, I took a theology of work class. Oh, wow. And that was that moment, oh. like the pizza snap into uh-huh. the place life, and you realize like, oh, oh, suddenly I have a supporting theological structure to help me make sense of what I'm doing. And it had this broad view of work, that work is not just what we do to collect a paycheck. It's mm-hmm. how we live out our God-given identity, the productive way that we engage the creative world. And so it's very like mm. broad and expansive. It added more pieces of foundation to this house I was building that had already been informed by my passion for faith and culture. And I, I had a right. big view of how God was at work in the world, but understanding how work came to be part of that foundation um, of faith really changed the trajectory of my life. I started teaching wow. about it in the local church and I saw ah. Christians' imaginations get sparked that their hearts would come alive when they saw a broader vision of how God was using who he made them to be. Wow. Um, and it began to gain specific resonance in women's lives. Mm, uh, I have no doubt in my mind. There's really a critical gap in discipleship for Christian mm-hmm. women. We're not doing whole life discipleship. No, we're uh, not. Mm-mm. We are excelling at biblical knowledge and spiritual disciplines. We're equipping women to have healthy relationships, friendships, marriages, to be great parents. But we really are not discipling women um, for godly influence in public life. And so as I saw that gap, as I saw that my own life was sitting in the gap and, and and I was feeling the tension of that need, um, I really stepped into it. So I've spent the last decade of my life working at the Denver Institute for Faith and Work, which is a Mm. local faith-based nonprofit here in Colorado. And we serve uh, both a local and national audience and we started doing some programming around women. We hosted an event called Women Work and Calling back in 2015. Yes. And it was, it blew the doors off. It was our largest event for years here at the oh. Institute. Because you just saw women coming out of the woodwork where it was like yeah. the first time in their lives that a faith conversation had really spoken into their work and leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and since then, we have just um, continued to grow the programming. And the pandemic was so fun. We went online in 2020 because we oh. couldn't person for our annual event. And suddenly we were a national thing. I love it. I want to be there so bad. I'm going to put oh, it on the calendar. You, know, you can watch yes. online this year. So oh. over the last three years, Women Working Calling has grown from being a local uh, event to building a, being a fully fledged initiative hosted by love Denver it. Institute, serving both a national and an international audience. And so there we have go. an annual event by the same name, which will be November 4th this year. Oh, Coming Ooh. out with InterVarsity Press and the annual event will be online. So we, like in the last three years, we've been in 36 U.S. states and 32 countries. And we're host, we have host sites in nine to 10 cities this year, which is really, okay. so, so it's not we, in person. It's, it's no, online. it is in person and online. You know, oh, oh, it is. Yeah. Hmm. There's something. Okay. For I'm everybody. noting that down. All right. And it's also available by replay. If you can't attend it you know, on November 4th. So this is, and I can attend. I'm going to look into that very seriously. So Hear that's me heart lifters. Of how the conversation is growing that Christian women are hungry mm-hmm. to have a richer conversation uh, yes. that really speaks to who God has made them to be mm-hmm. and the am- godly ambition that they have to bring Ooh. glory to God and to love him and serve others through their calling. I think you just really struck a nerve with that word ambition. I love yeah. that you put godly ambition. Yes. Oh, we use, I love we it. use some of those like words that would normally feel charged all the time because God recharged all things, he even does. the soft words that are difficult for a lot of women. But I was saying to you before we hit record, I am 63. I came from that generation. I'm going to use another buzzword, patriarchal 
situation where a strong woman, strong leader didn't really go over so well. It did if you were working in the children's ministry or you were working in women's ministry, but uh, outside in the world of commerce, because I will just share openly, I think I've shared this before, but I felt really called. I was a dancer my whole life. So I felt called to open a, a dance studio, a Christian dance studio. And I distinctly remember the head elder saying, if you do that, God will take his hand off your life because you you need to be the head of our children's ministry because I was leaving that position. And I just distinctly remember that, oh my God, God, God will take his hand off my life. Now I know so much more about trauma. I know so much more about religious trauma, spiritual abuse. I know all of these things now, but then I'm a young buck man with three little kids. And all I want to do is just fulfill my calling and teach children and young adults how to worship God and use dance as a, a tool you know, in our community, I didn't realize the weight of thinking God would take his hand off my life, but you know what? I have a very strong husband and he's like, you're doing this. I'm so glad. I'm I'm so grateful. And you know what happened? God didn't take his hand off my life. (laughs) No. And that was just manipulative of them that they even suggested that I would love to sit those gentlemen down and say, Mm -hmm. let's open the scriptures and look at how work is one of the central themes of our identity and how we join Christ in the renewal of all things. Let me take Mm -hmm. you to the writing of, of, church leaders like Martin Luther, John yes. Calvin, embrace the value of work and living mm-hmm. with and for God in, in any vocation. Like it's, yeah. it's critical that we begin it to is. shift the conversation to empower the gifts of God's people mm-hmm. for the broader work of God in the world. Yeah. And I think much like your story, I think my story, I have more of those, many more. And uh, I haven't been brave enough I haven't been courageous enough to really speak and use my voice. Hmm. I still struggle with it. I know. Well, I I am not over it for sure. But significant things have happened this past year, particularly relationships, movies, things have happened in my life that I have just sat at the end of these uh, interactions and gone, oh, I can't be silent anymore. Hmm. No, I have to be courageous. And what does that look like? Is is that a part of how you feel as well? I mean, you are, this is, we think we've come a long way, Joanna, but have we really, have we really come a long way as women in the faith community? I'm curious. I really want to know this from you. I want your perspective. You know, I, I have come to realize that every woman's story is unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, just when I think I see some general trends and I've observed enough people's lives that I can I can speak to that. But I think I would want our listeners to know that every woman's story is unique and it's shaped by a number of factors. Things like our age and the generation we're part of. Yeah. Uh, if you have grown up in a faith community or outside one, your denominational background, right. your region of the country that you were mm-hmm. raised in your own family dynamics, uh, the type of giftedness and field like industry that you were part of, mm-hmm. all of that can shape your experience. Um, and so I will say, you know, we're slightly different in age, mm-hmm. uh, but we are not younger millennials or Gen Z. And so right. I think our lives have been very shaped by certain periods of of culture and church history. And so you probably experienced the, the sexual mm-hmm. revolution and the women's movement of the 70s. And so- <laughs> A lot of church uh, thinking about gender was reactionary to that. Yes, very much. I'm a child so. of the 80s, and so mm. my own life was heavily shaped by teaching of groups like Focus on the Family, which yes. you know did some amazing work in enriching mm-hmm. the the family itself, mm-hmm. but did some damage in mm-hmm. elevating uh, stay at home motherhood as the um, kind of biblical ideal for women. That's where I, I lived. I would argue you're not going to see that anywhere in the pages of scripture. And so instead of being a place where women felt free to make stewardship decisions, and if, if, if staying home is what she decided, let's celebrate and affirm that, yes. but it shouldn't be held up as the better option no, or elevated as, as the holiest of all things. Yeah. You know, uh, I just have seen uh, so many women my age and even in their fifties in the wake of despair and in yeah. the wake of grief over, over feeling like a failure, right. Or feeling like they didn't fulfill their purpose. So you're absolutely right. We elevated, we elevated things like breastfeeding. I mean, just weird, like 
having yeah. a baby without having a C-section. Oh my gosh, you're amazing. Or, you know, natural childbirth or medicated childbirth. I mean, yeah. it's just, we could go on and on, but cloth I want to- or plastic diapers. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Of course I use cloth diapers. I had them delivered to my house. Of course I didn't have an epidural. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> I don't have children. And yet I understand the nuances of this issue because it's such a cultural thing. It's in such circles. a hot topic. And you know, one of the things that you say, Joanna, that, I mean, it just makes me want to weep is that, you know, the world needs who God made you to be. Yeah, I really want, women working it's calls. your tagline. I know, but it's so important. And I want every heart lifter listening, every person listening, just take a breath in that. The world needs who God made you to be. Who is that? Who is that person? You know, that if we don't find that out, mm, I'm a little concerned, you know, about the future that lays ahead of us. And so one of the things that you talk about, and one of the reasons I wanted you here, Joanna, because there are a million, and it is really hard for me to stay focused with you right now, because... I just want to be at a table with you and have such a great conversation because this book is rich. It is so rich. You tell us to realize our vocational power. I've just never heard it said that way. And I want to know what you mean by that. And I love the word realize. I love that verb. Oh my goodness. What a great position of that verb. It's a little bit like stepping into. It's like, how do you think? Stepping into. Mm -hmm. I think we have to start back with that word vocation. Okay, teach me, please, teach us. Vocation, it, it comes from the Latin word vox, which means voice. Um, it is parallel to the word calling. It's the idea that someone has called us or drawn us to something. And so it raises the question of saying, you know, what is your vocation? What or, or what does it mean to be called? One of the things that I have found um, that is empowering for believers, whether they are men or women, is understanding the breadth and the generality of God's call. One of the things that's hard is when we think about calling is I think there are a lot of cultural norms that have built up around it in in faith circles. And so one of the key ones is the idea that everyone has a very distinctive call that God is going to reveal to them. And that's how you're supposed to uh, expect a God to like write it on the wall or in the yes. sky, Joanna moved to Alaska or something yes. like that. Yes. Um, Be this. Yes. yes. Cause we see examples of that in scripture. I've been mm-hmm. uh, influenced by two professors from Denver seminary, uh, mm-hmm. Bill Klein and Dan Steiner, who wrote a book, uh, what does it mean to be called? And Ooh. They, they look at, um, I can provide the link for your listeners. Uh, we want the links, all the links. Um, <laughs> And one of the things I talk about is the difference between the very specific call that God would give heroes of scripture um, Mm -hmm. and the general call that every believer receives. And so I like that that distinction Mm because they said, you know, we see this direct voice of God to people like Moses through the Mm -hmm. burning bush or Paul getting knocked off a horse on the road to Damascus or Mary in Mm -hmm. um, Mary in the uh, annunciation in response to that. Yeah. It's a direct instruction from God about what he wanted them to do. And as they look at this, they say, you know, look at all that language around calling for those individuals. Mm -hmm. Those are people that were specifically set apart for extraordinary work in establishing the nation of Israel or the establishment of the early church. And they said, not all of us are that special. We aren't set aside for the, that specific a call um, that God has for us. But if you look more broadly at language around calling in scripture, you see this general invitation to any believer. A great example is 2 Peter 1, which talks mm. about um, living a life worthy of the calling that you receive. And yeah. then in the verses that follow, Peter goes on to list the character qualities that that grow from that. Right. So many of the examples of calling in scripture are very general and they refer to what does it look like to live a life that's faithfully surrendered to the Lord, mm-hmm. a life of discipleship and growing character, a life of service, of loving our neighbors. Um, and suddenly you realize like, oh, those, if that's the only rest- instruction I received from the Lord, that's a pretty compelling marching order. There's enough richness there. Oh, Yes. That with discernment and wise stewardship of our lives, 
we can really figure out what it looks like to live a faithful life. We know that God will be present with us. We don't have to be afraid of missing out on that call. Mm -hmm. But it allows us to live a life of daily discernment with the Lord. Of course, we believe that God speaks to us every day and we want to be sensitive to that, but we don't have to be paralyzed waiting for a specific, unique expression of what God wants us to do. I was dialoguing with a friend who said, like, I get that, but I still somehow worry that I'm going to miss out on what God has for Mm -hmm. me. Oh, yeah. I hear that all the time. Yeah. I say it all the time. (laughs) But would a loving God do that? No, No, no. Mm-mm. If we're fully surrendered to him and we're seeking mm. God, oh. listening to him, he's not going to hide his direction for us. And so when we think about vocational power, we have to go back to that and say, what does it mean to be called? Mm-hmm. And so when I think for, in particular for Christian women, when we have that broad view of calling, suddenly the frame that we live within gets really, really big mm-hmm. and all the unique roles and responsibilities that we have fit within it, which I love because I do love that. That's a place of grace and inspiration. For that's it true is. for men and women alike. Yes. But I think women feel a particular pressure in that. Is that mm-hmm. it's a place where God says, "How will you steward the life that I have given you?" Mm-hmm. In light of all the circumstances, your gifts, the pressures, the uniqueness of your family situation or life stage, how are you going to steward these complicated factors as you seek to follow my broader purposes? I love that. There's a lot of freedom there. And so So much freedom is saying, Mm. okay, let's understand who we are, how God has made us and where he's put us. What is your unique sphere of influence? There it is. And then what are the particular tangible skills that you've been given Mm -hmm. um, that you can use for God's glory in the world? And, um, you know, that may be through actually sharing the words and love of Christ it may be joining Christ in the renewal of all things, where off, which is often where work comes in. Often we, if we mm-hmm. limit our vision of the Christian life just to the act of faithfulness and sharing our faith, um, it's a pretty narrow, narrow bucket for what a successful Christian life looks like. Right. But if we join Christ in bringing out God's goodness, beauty, and truth in any area of life, or that we join him in healing what is broken or what has been distorted by the effects of sin, Yes. All of a sudden we realize, like, oh, God has gifted me. He's put me someplace mm-hmm. and there is godly work to be done in this place. Recognizing that is part of vocational power. So I often think of it as a little bit like an illustration of a oh, big cake that lays on its an side. Infinity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an infinity symbol. And the gospel's right in the middle, that little small point where the two crosses of that like loop that. Your eight cross. That's the gospel. And on the left side of that swoop is our own personal discipleship of yes. saying, God developing my character, mm-hmm. my understanding of him, my understanding myself, my sanctification, like mm-hmm. that's all part of the Fluidity. power process. Mm-hmm. It's just right. sticking, you know, the ongoing work and, and, you know, work shapes our souls. And so that's oh, where yes. kind of the left side of this process is playing out. But then as we sweep to the right, the right side of that infinity symbol, that's our public lives. And so we're beginning to ask mm-hmm. like, what's my sphere of influence? Where is God asking me to exercise yes. power? What are the unique um, gifts that he's given me? There's a book called Kingdom Calling, Vocational Stewardship for the Common Good by Amy oh. Sherman. And it oh. is. Oh, and yes. Book. It's about faith and work out there. You talk but about she, Amy in this chapter, specific, by the way. Yeah. It's specific areas of vocational power. So it may be mm-hmm. the relational network that you have. Mm-hmm. You may have work or if you're if you're not like in a paid position, you may have social influence in your community that gives you a platform. Mm-hmm. Um, you may have specific access to money or, um, or you may have specific skills that have, you know, skills related to your job that have power. And so part of seizing your vocational power is like understanding what really has God given you. What's the sphere of influence? What are the specific mm-hmm. tools? And then how are you going to wisely use them? Um, and so mm-hmm. that's part of stepping into your vocational power. And I'm sad to say most churches have never, ever invited a Christian woman to consider those things about her own oh. life. Not in my world anyway. That's all I can say. Not in the world in which I was nurtured or grown up in my Christian faith, for sure. There were a few options. There weren't many. And as I just said, when I decided to step outside of that option, I I, <laughs> I was told something that was very traumatizing at that yeah. point. You know, some very hurtful words that took me a while to, well, if I'm honest, still, you know, 
like, okay, God's, God's hand's still on me. You know, yeah. we have a negativity bias. So we're going to remember those negative things that have been said, unless we do work. I would love to go back just for a moment, just for a moment to pick your really amazing brain about the root of vocation Vox being voice. Is it safe to say, because I say this a lot, I've written a lot about it, how to find your voice, because I had to find my own. Yeah. I still am there. Like I can think for myself. I can hear for myself. I can talk for myself. I can choose for myself. I don't Mm. have to go to the board of elders to get approval to who I marry. Yes, I had to do that. Or what job I can do if I can have a job. I mean, that sounds a lot like a cult, doesn't it? And that you can't think for yourself. So I'm wondering in my work to find my own voice and help other women find their voice and even some men down along the line in my work that our voice is a vocation in and of itself. When I think of my voice and how many encounters I have during an ordinary day of how I use my voice to bring life, is it safe to say that we all have a vocation to use our voice as a spokesperson? Is that safe? I just love that. Yeah. You know, I think God calls us to himself. That is the heart of calling. You know, that's the beginning and end of calling is that God calls us to himself. And so when we respond to him, we bring all that we are to him, which Mm -hmm. is just wonderfully freeing. Because I think for women, we can tend to find parts of ourselves acceptable and parts of ourselves less desirable or in need of improvement. And yeah, I want to talk about that in a minute. (laughs) And God calls us because all that we are to him. And he shapes and empowers all that we are for life with him and his purposes in the world. And so I just think about like the very opening pages of scripture, the opening chapters of Genesis, we see that women and men are made in God's image. And so you think about using our voice, part of being made in God's image means that we're a living reflection every day of what it what God is like. And each of us brings a unique kind of piece of that <laughs> whole. And so for us not to use our voices is is to maybe neglect the image of God in us. And this is an ongoing struggle for Mm -hmm. women, both of Mm -hmm. faith and of different spiritual perspectives. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Challenge women face in the workplace is figuring out how do they have the confidence to communicate clearly? And then Mm -hmm. also how do they make sure their voice is heard in a word world that is attuned to the way men communicate? Um, and so there's yes. often, you know, academic studies have labeled that the double, the double bind is like, how does a woman express competence that's mm-hmm. viewed as competence by male peers and also maintain her likability? The studies show that like you can be one or the other, but very right. Rarely. And exactly. that, that really flows back to voice too and leadership. Yes, presence. it does. So that's an ongoing mm-hmm. challenge for a lot of women. Goodness. That's a journey for me. I I still in my own work, even though I know I am deeply respected and cared for by the men on my team, I still qualify statements all the time in meetings. Ah, Almost explain to us what that means. Somebody might not yeah, know what so that means. Qualifying would be um, saying things that diminish or distract from what I have to say. So Ooh. it might be something like, mm. uh, this might only be of interest to certain parts of our audience, but X, Y, or Z. Or... I don't know if this will interest you, but, you know, I almost always add some disclaimer before I say what I really want to say, because maybe I'm still figuring out why I do it, if it's habit or if it's actually an area of insecurity, Um, Uh but I don't just show up and graciously and confidently say what I have to say. Well, I would think um, a lot of that's preconditioning, Mm -hmm. right? at least in my own life, it would be preconditioning because when in, I did do that, I was told some really hard things or called a rebel or kicked out of this or kicked out of that, you know, or just stay yeah. away from her. You can't teach anymore. I mean, I could go on and yet did it with, I mean, I, here's the rub. Here's what my husband and I talk about all the time, especially after seeing, I'm just going to go ahead and say it the two movies, one was women talking and then another one is the Barbie movie. So after seeing the Barbie movie, particularly because it's fresh, hot off the press, I just went last week with a dear 
friend who's on the front lines in Thailand changing the world. And she's so great. She's like, you're not going alone because I know what's going to happen when you watch it alone. So Mm -hmm. I'm home and I want to go with you so we can have some great conversations about it. I think the overarching theme, what I wanted to ask you about Joanna was it's not that we need or that I want all female Supreme Court or females to dominate. I want integration. And that's a huge part of your work. Yeah. You know, I just want equality in the truest, godliest sense of the word. And it is how my marriage works. We've had to work on that, obviously, with the kind of teachings we were under. And yet my husband has always valued my voice, which I'm grateful for, but that's not the case everywhere. So what is this beautiful synergy or integration that we hope to see that women are valued within these systems? What are, what are you hoping for out of your work? Yeah, I'm thankful that you asked because it's so important. I mean, women's empowerment does not exist as an end unto itself. No. I lead women work in calling to work myself out of a job. Like I yes. a point where we didn't need for something like this to exist. Yeah, me too. But again, we go right back to the beginning of Genesis where we see that men and women are called together. We are. You know, mm-hmm. before Christ you know, God's first instructions to humanity are in those opening pages of Genesis, what's referred to as the creation mandate. And the, he says, be fruitful and multiply, multiply, steward the earth and care for it. You see this co-laboring for the purposes of yes. God has designed us for. And so that sense of integration and collaboration is powerful and should be a guiding framework for what we do. I want to read you a quote, but before I do, um, Mm-hmm. I think it's helpful to acknowledge I, I've I've grown up and continue to worship in a conservative denominational tradition. Okay. And I struggle with that sometimes because mm-hmm. I think it's very easy in those systems um, to have a passive approach to developing women's gifts. And mm-hmm. that's where I kick against the stall like a horse would, mm-hmm. where I would say, like, okay, even in the most conservative theological framework, if you're in that. You may believe that there are certain roles and responsibilities in church life and marriage that are limited to women, Mm -hmm. but everything outside of that should be open, should be open and women should be empowered and we should be proactive about developing them all the way up to whatever you consider to be the limitation within your theological framework. And Mm -hmm. I rarely see that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Over time, I've become less aligned with that theological tradition because I I, I think it's negligent in the stewardship of God's people not to okay. be proactive in developing women. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that happen all too often in more mm-hmm. traditional conservative circles. I'm not saying it can't happen there. Mm-hmm. I'm saying culturally it doesn't. And I think that's really, mm-hmm. that's really an issue. But let and, me read But it. I'm happy you said that. And I'm happy that that's why I wanted you, Joanna, here, because that's what your book content speaks and says. And it's all about collaboration. It's all about finding, you know, equality and purpose together, working together. Yeah. And, you know, outside of those kind of specifically defined categories that more conservative traditions Mm -hmm. would say are not open to women, all of public life is. And that's where that discipleship gap, you begin to see the consequences of that. You know, most of us live the majority of our lives in public. If you're working, Mm -hmm. those kind of gendered limitations on your leadership don't apply here. And so if we're not Mm -hmm. discipling women for the full scope of life, if we're only talking to them about what they can't do, we're actually not empowering God's people for his work in the world. So it has, we're we're not, yeah, we're not doing what Jesus did. That's for sure. Have you ever read anything by the author, Carolyn Custis James? Oh, yes. Yes. She's one of my heroes. Okay. Can I read you a little bit from her? You can read me anything you want to read. She's way more poetic. And it talks about this interdependence that you've been alluding to. Okay. She says she um, coins the relationship between men and women as a blessed alliance. What God has put together. Oh, that's good. Hold on to that because it it preaches. (laughs) She said the notion that things work better and human. The notion that things work better and human beings are their best selves when men and women work together is found on page one of the Bible. When God was launching the most ambitious enterprise the world has ever known, the team he put together to do the job was male and female. 
Adam and Eve faced a challenge of Mount Everest proportions that required a solid connection between themselves and their creator. Together, they were charged with looking after things on his behalf, wisely to steward and utilize the earth's resources. And their goal together was to build his gracious kingdom on earth. No square inch of earth is excluded. No arena of life is beyond the parameters of their joint rule. Mm, mm, mm. And that to me is a clarion call for any person of faith, both to this interdependent life Mm -hmm. and also to the full scope of God's work in creation. Um, I I just love it. I read it because Carolyn is such a, Mm -hmm. she's artistic and effective in how she communicates. And I think more of us could sit with those concepts and really let our life resonate with them. Heartlifter, we're going to take a break. Joanna has given us a lot to think about. In this season of trying to understand and learn and grow in the new language of love, Joanna invites us to the table to look at our own lives as women and discover perhaps afresh our vocation, our calling. She writes in chapter four, what it means to be called. To understand what calling or vocation means, let's start with the roots. Kate Harris, author of Wonder Women, Navigating the Challenges of Motherhood, Calling, and Identity, understands the difficulty of defining one's vocation well. She writes, Vocation is derived from the Latin word vox, or voice, translated into Greek as call. So we take the broadest view of things. Vocation is one's entire life lived in response to God's voice, God's call. I'm going to read that again. So, so, just so good. We take the broadest view of things. Vocation is one's entire life lived in response to God's voice, God's call. Our various occupations, those activities, efforts, relationships, and responsibilities that quite literally occupy us day by day, and season by season, comprise how we see and make sense of our unique vocation as it is lived into over a lifetime. Most of our chatter about vocation tends to devolve into a conversation about titles and roles, skills and contributions, jobs and careers. While this is a sensible way to put expression to our various efforts and intentions, we should recognize these singular explanations never sufficiently account for the fullness of our complex identities made in the image of a complex Trinitarian God. We don't want to grapple with the overwhelming dimensionality of our calling, so instead we apply language that helps us wrap our heads around us. As Kate Harris explains, our call touches every facet of life and is discerned through an active relationship with God. The following principles offer further clarification about calling, and I'm just going to give those to you quickly. Calling is more general than it is specific. A common misconception about calling is that God has predetermined every detail of our lives and will tell us specifically what he wants us to do. As author Oz Guinness explains, we are not called to do something or go somewhere. We are called to someone, capital S. We are not called first to special work, but to God. The key to answering the call is to be devoted to no one and to nothing above God himself. Wow, this is really speaking to my heart today. Second, calling is usually formed rather than found. You may think, if God would just tell me what to do, then I would do it. Instead, our call takes shape over time as he leads us through circumstances that strengthen and form our character. Like a block of marble that will become a sculpture, God gradually sculpts us into the shape that best serves the opportunities and relationships ahead. We may not see what the final form will be, 
but we can trust that each step or strike of God's chisel will form us according to his design. Our call, your call, Heartlifter, often expresses itself in layered ways through our roles and relationships. You may be a spouse, an aunt, a citizen, an employee. Third, calling is not something that we passively wait to figure out. We can confidently explore opportunities, knowing that God will never leave us. This word in Matthew 28, 20, (laughs) Jesus reminded his disciples, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is an invitation to take steps forward as we trust, as we look, and as we see. This week's podcast prompt is taken from page 23 of Joanna's book, How is God's General Call to Relationship with Him, to a Life of Discipleship, to Serving Others, Expressed in Your Life? And I'm going to add today, in this season, as you reflect on your life, how have you seen God prepare you over time for future opportunities? What might this reveal about your calling? And drumroll, please, Heartlifters, meet me over on our brand new online community platform, Heartlift Central. All you have to do is go to heartliftcentral.substack.com. Meet me there and we will continue this remarkable conversation about women, work, and calling.